Assalamu salamu alaykum and welcome to the CMUQ community and a special welcome to the visitors who are joining us to, for today's Dean's Lecture. I'm Michael Trick, I'm the Dean here at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar and I thank you all for coming to today's presentation. Today I am extremely pleased to introduce a businesswoman and entrepreneur, Sheikh Anadi Nasser Altani, to the Dean's Lecture Series. Sheikh Anadi is a founder and chairperson of Amwal, which is Qatar's first regulated investment company. Amwal was first in Qatar to offer financial planning and wealth management, and they launched Qatar's first mutual fund, first Islamic mezzanine private equity fund, and first money market fund. For students who have aspirations in entrepreneurship, Sheikh Anadi also exemplifies how you can bring together business success and community service. Sheikh Anadi has a particular interest in business education, serves as a trustee on the board of the College for Business and Economics at Qatar University. She is the chairperson of Injaz Qatar, an organization that has mentored many of our entrepreneurial-minded students. She is also a member of the Middle East Board of Planet Finance and a member of the advisory board of the Harvard Business Review, Al Arabia. Sheikh Anadi has been a friend of CMUQ for many years. We were just looking at her picture on the hallway as she had given the uh, graduation speech for the class of 2009, which was only our second graduating class and the first class in this building. Thank you, Sheikh Anadi, for continuing to be part of our extended CMUQ family. Students, faculty, guests, Please join me in welcoming Sheikha Hanadi to the Dean's Lecture Series. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Dean Trick, distinguished guests, fellow uh, faculty, and dear students. I'm actually very honored to be here today. As Dean Trick uh, mentioned, the last time I was here, it was in 2009, and I actually can't believe it has been 10 years since then. A, a very long time before that, I was sitting in your seats. I was a student myself. I was supposed to be uh, graduating with a plan, but this rarely happened. Just to give you an idea of when I was a student, the population of Qatar at that time was around 360,000 uh, 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 people. We had one university. Um, we had two uh, bridges. One was Ras Abud and the other one was Al Jeda. We had one department store called the Center, if you know it or you don't. The uh, our GDP was around $3 billion per year, uh, coming from the, uh, three, uh, the production of 300,000 barrels of oil. And women's participation in the labor market was hovering around 18 to 20%. Today we sit here, while the population of Qatar is around 2.7 million. We have numerous universities, some under Qatar Foundation, some are privately owned. Qatar University itself has many, many colleges within it. The GDP of Qatar has reached $192 billion per year, coming from the production of 4.8 barrels of oil equivalent that will actually increase to reach 6.5 barrel equivalents in 2025 and the participation of women in the labor market is the highest in the Middle East at 52 percent and let's not speak about bridges and roads because you all go through the hassle of traffic and the new bridges every day my university years were very special to me they were when long-term friendships were built where I learned a lot about a lot of different things that were uh, around me um, from history to philosophy to everything. But as well, I sharpened my skills in economics, the subject matter that I chose to be my own, uh, my own uh, degree. But again, when I graduated, 
I was supposed to have a plan, a plan for my life, but this didn't happen. I find it very difficult to be asked to stand here and empower you. You are a generation that has been highly invested in. All the efforts have come to make your life built on the idea of power. So I will not mention this word again, the word empower, but instead I'm going to speak about my own experience, what I've learned through my career, and maybe I will aspire you rather than empower you. Three decades later from when I was sitting with you, one of the most difficult questions that anyone would ask me is, what do you do? Usually if one of my kids is standing, this is the time they roll their eyes because this will take me into a very long conversation of what I do. You see, to me, what I do defies who I am. So I tried to simplify it. A couple of years ago, you know, I tried to simplify the whole discussion of what do I do into two, three simple words. The first, I am a mother. The second, I'm an entrepreneur. And the third, I'm an advocate. And I think that sums up my life story. So now to what I've learned. The first lesson I learned through my career is that you start with plan A, but you really end up with plan Z. When I was at university, the first day of university, I was on my way to go and uh, register for the uh, College of Engl uh, at the College of uh, English Literature to have a degree in English Literature. And on my way, I found this little desk with someone sitting on it with um, a sign of the College of Administration and Economics. It was the first thing, you know, never heard of it before. So I thought, you know, why waste your time? What am I going to do if I had a degree in administration and economics? At that time, most uh, all, well, almost all women were employed in two sectors in the economy, healthcare and education. So I needed something that will make me employable. Economics and administration would not make me employable. So I started speaking to the professor who was sitting there and you know, I was, and you know, he found out I was good in math, why don't you try it out, so and so. So I thought, yalla, get a leap of faith. I registered in the, in the College of Administration and Economics. I loved it. It just opened my mind off. Studying economics for me was something that became a passion. I graduated so happily. I was the top of my class and one of the top of the university students. But then I wanted a job. So I started writing my CV and sending it off. And I found out I was unemployable because a woman who studied economics at that time can teach mathematics in middle school, but cannot work within the economics degree she had. So I was jobless for like six months, and then I thought, okay, what can I do? So I settled, the, uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Labor at that time gave you uh, options, and one of the options was to become an administrator back in the university, and I went back to Qatar University and started becoming a research assistant. That means I prepare slides, I prepare what the professor needs, but I never stand in front of students. I can, ah, and I used to as well uh, grade his uh, papers, but never do something meaningful. So the first thing that I settled for was this uh, uh, teaching, uh, uh, teaching assistant uh, 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 job. And I found out that I liked economics. I wasn't doing something that I liked, and I needed to know more. So I decided to get my first master's, and it was a master's in economics. Out of all the applied things I could choose, I got a master's in econometrics. For people who don't know, econometrics is mathematical economics. 
as far away from applicable sciences as possible. Came back to Doha very happy. I, am, I have a master of econometrics. I'm going to change the world. Well, jobless again, unemployable. So settled again, went back to my old job without anything and started again. But this time the professors thought, okay, she knows a bit now, so let's get her to teach with me. So I started teaching at university. But again, I wasn't content, so I started writing. Um, as you know, economists are usually people who use big words to describe things. I started thinking about problems that were around me, looking at it from my analytical point of view, looking at it from what I studied in economics, and making you know, just observations, and started writing in the newspapers under just initials. And at the time, I wanted to start my own business. I actually was, you know, I felt that I had, I had something to do, I couldn't do it. So I started my own business. Um, and here I'd like to just point out one thing. In life, there are two kinds of people. There are people who are salaried employees. Usually they work in organization, they work on, in, some, in something and they get a salary. And on the other part, there are creators, entrepreneurs that take risk and create their own income. In Qatar, we have something in the middle who are salaried employees who want the uh, um, assurances of a salary, but are as well babbling with entrepreneurship. And they are in the middle, you know, it's security with a bit of risk. I was one of those. So at the time I was working at the university, I was researching for my own personal uh, uh, benefit and I was starting my proposal as a, for the PhD. I had two kids under the age of two and I was trying slash struggling to establish a new business. So what do you think happened? I failed. I actually failed. I closed off the business after a year and a half I decided that I cannot throw good money after bad money, and I just decided to say I failed. I needed to change things. But from this failure, I wanted to understand what was happening. Why did I fail? My children were very young at the time, and they were my priority. I shouldn't have started a business at that time. What I had learned at university was unapplicable to the business I started. So I didn't have any knowledge on applying that to my business. So I had a lack of skills. And I was convinced that, sorry, but lecturing at the university was not my calling, so I stopped my PhD as well. So, I went back to university, went back to writing, and went back to researching. And thus, the idea of the Qatar Ladies Investment Company came. It was a, a report that I wrote about the dormant, investment, uh, the dormant savings of women that are sitting idle and not being rechanneled into the Qatari economic success. Through there, uh, I found out that there was no laws in Qatar that, per, uh, that gave permission to investment companies. You only got a commercial license to establish an investment company. So I started working with the Qatar Central Bank for two years to establish the first law in Qatar. It was called law number 15 for the investment companies. And thus, my company, the Qatar Ladies Investment Company, was the first company to be licensed under uh, the Central Bank of Qatar. But I learned from my mistakes. I brought in experts that could help me. I convinced partners that would come and work with me. And I convinced as well uh, uh, shareholders that would come and share my risk. And through the second year, I was convinced that I didn't know anything about finance, so I pursued my MA in finance. So, I have three lessons here. Failure is a good thing. Never, never shy away from your failures. On the contrary, they're the best learning thing that can happen, can happen to you. 
learn from your failures, but make sure that the next experience you do, you learn from everything from your failures and you try to twist it around. And that's not always a guaranteed thing for success because there are other things that you will learn. So you, you prepare yourself, you pursue things, and you are consistent in your pursuit. Qatar Ladies Investment Company was not a success for the first five years. We had to pursue, we had to rearrange our strategy, relook, look at the business plan, become, and then we decided money is not a female thing. Men and women need financial uh, uh, planning. Men and women need avenues for investments. So by the third year, 50% of our clients were men. So we opened it up. We changed the whole concept. From Qatar Ladies Investment Company, it became Amwal. And Amwal became an investment company that looked into asset management, investment banking, as well as corporate finance. While I was doing that and while I was you know, trying to promote my company, I found out that my role was educational more than only promotional. So we used to go and educate people about financial literacy. What does it mean to have um, a mutual, what is a mutual fund? How much does a credit card have an interest? How much do you pay interest on your credit card? What is an overdraft? What do you do with these things? But I found out it wasn't only that this financial literacy was completely uh, unknown towards this segment of the market, the segment that I was marketing in, but it was virtually non-existent in our educational systems. So I started working with the Ministry of Education to look at ways how can we introduce financial literacy into the uh, curriculum of our schools and universities. And it was by pure coincidence that I met someone in the World Economic Forum, a very, very interesting lady, Thuraya Salti, and she was telling me that she was establishing in Jaz al-Arab, a part of junior achievement. Uh, she was establishing it in Jordan, and she was looking for partners to establish it as on the Arab world, but establish as well um, uh, uh, franchises in, in the countries. So I became a part of Injaz al-Arab on one side, and I founded and started Injaz Qatar on the other side. Now, a non-for-profit that was established by someone who is unknown, me, and that had no links with the government, was something out of Mars. I convinced some of my fellow uh, business uh, people, and one of them is just sitting here, Ashraf Abu Isa, who was with me on the founding board. I convinced them. I don't know how, I convinced them. I convinced ExxonMobil to be a partner. I convinced some of the banks to be a partner. So you convince these business people about the importance of doing that. It was another hassle to make sure that you can be registered as a non-for-profit. It took me three years to register a non-for-profit by the private sector in Qatar. No, 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 it can never be done, it can never happen. These are the only things that I heard. And ah, by the way, why are you doing this was another question. My takeaway, be persistent. If you believe in something, never take no for an answer. The only constant is change. Change will happen, but you have to convince people about it. But before you convince people, you should be convinced your, in, uh, yourself. You should walk the talk. And this is how Injaz Qatar became the first Injaz in the Arab world to have a full non-for-profit registration in its own country. So challenge the norms. My next learning might be a bit difficult to say as a sentence in front of all of you Carnegie uh, students with all of your knowledge. But believe me, you don't know anything. And as soon as you believe that, then you start learning. You graduate from university with this massive degree, beautifully massive degree. You'd love to put it on the wall, be happy, tell everyone I'm a Carnegie Mellon uh, graduate. But it's nothing. 
your BSc, your graduation, your degree is a key. Knowledge is a huge universe and there is a door in front of it. You have the key to start unlocking the door. So it's up to you. You can be a graduate without any knowledge. And I've seen a lot of those. And you can pursue knowledge. And this is what I'm um, empowering you to do. How do you pursue knowledge? The first thing is read. Read, read, read. In your subject matter, outside of your subject matter. Don't read only synopsis or, art or articles. There is a beautiful thing about reading a book because it gives you the mind of the writer, how he analyzes things, how he looks about things, how things flow. A book can never, never be replaced. The second thing is listen. We have so many speakers in this country, but we don't have a lot of listeners. Listening is an art. You need to listen. You need to understand. You need to grasp knowledge from people that are in front of you. And then, I'm telling you, your first degree is nothing. Get further degree. Anytime you feel that you need more knowledge, go for it. Get your second master, third master, fourth master. Get your executive education. Don't go for workshops for breakfast and coffee breaks. Go for workshops in the, in the uh, atmosphere that you're going to apply the knowledge when you go back to work, to your home, or to your business. And try to surround yourself with people who actually ignite your um, uh, and challenge your intellect. This is a very important thing. If you always meet the same people and speak about the same thing, you become monotyped. You know, it's always the same. You have to meet new people. You have to see new challenges. Speak to people with really, really uh, out normal, you know, outrageous ideas. S listen to them. They open up things in your mind. So always speak to interesting people and try to surround yourself. And that can, cannot happen every day. You'll kill yourself. But at least once a week, once every two weeks. And one thing. And I'm not quite clear if this is, you know, what your career uh, uh, advisors tell you. Always look for new challenges. On average, uh, an average person around the world changes their career five to seven times. So the career you are in is something that you're doing now. Try to be good at it. Give it your 100%, but reading, having this idea and knowledge uh, around you gives you new opportunities as well. And you can grasp these new opportunities and go into new careers. All the new studies about the new workplace gives the success of a person in the, these uh, workplace for new two, two main aspects, adaptability, being able to adapt to the changing climate around you. And I'm telling you what, you know, the workforce that I went in 27 years ago is completely different than the workplace that I'm in today. So adaptability is a very important thing. And this actually will be faster in your generation. With AI, with, with everything happening around you, the workplace will change. You have to be adaptable. You cannot be set in your ways. And relearning. We learn things, but we need to le relearn them. Some things we, we studied at university have been proven wrong. I, you know, as an economist, a lot of the theories that were given to me as a given now are challenges. You need to relearn things. And I think these two things are basics for your success in the workforce of the future. Well, my career progressed. And in 2001, I was asked to join my family business. Um, creating something from scratch is easy compared to going to a family business which was structured and has its norm, it has its own corporate environment, it has its sacred cows, it has everything. 
So I was asked to go into my family business. We needed to restructure, we needed to turn around, and we needed to draw policies, new policies and procedures, and to modernize. So a year later, I decided, no, I needed to learn more. So I did my MBA. Well, I went for my MBA to actually understand what I should do uh, in uh, my work. But one of the first things that we did uh, on the MBA, one professor was teaching us, and he asked us a very simple question. Write your eulogy. Does anyone know what a eulogy is? Anyone doesn't know? Should I explain it? Usually, um, when you die, someone writes a, an article or something about you. She was a mother, she did this, she did that, you know. It's something that remains, people remember you by. Well, when he told me that, I froze. I couldn't write a single word. It was actually so shocking for me to think, what will I leave after I passed away? So I went to my MBA thinking that I will benefit for my family business. I will study business, restructuring, M&As, everything high. I came back with an understanding that if you do not balance your life, if you do not do things that you are passionate about, then your life is worthless. Having success in the workplace is nothing if you don't, have, if you don't feel fulfilled in other places in your life. And that was one of the most important lessons I've learned from my MBA. Please don't say that to London Business School because I've paid a lot of money for that MBA. So understanding yourself, establish your own priorities, and live by your own rules. This was very important to me. I came back with uh, a concept of 888. Do you know it? Eight hours to sleep, eight hours to work, and eight hours for yourself. If you can do that, it's perfect. Of course, you can't do that every day, but you have to have that in the back of your mind. This is how a normal human being uh, lives. For us workaholics, Salah, we actually work 14 hours a day, we hardly sleep, and we hardly see our families. That is wrong. That is not content. That is not something you want your eulogy to be about. But as well, you always want to leave something behind. Steve Jobs once said, I want to leave a dent on the universe. Of course, I'm no Steve Jobs. I'm not going to invent the iPhone, I, I, but he wanted to leave a dent on the universe. Doesn't every one of us want to leave a dent on the universe? I know I want. So since then, fast forward, I've been um, invited into different boards, uh, local, international. I sit on advisory councils. I sit on educational boards. I sit on nonprofit boards. And I do a whole shade of a lot of things. But one thing I've noticed as well is the low representation of women on these boards. So I started the 30% club. The 30% Club is an initiative that we started on the whole Gulf with an, with an aim to increase women's participation on the board level. Of course, in Qatar, we have uh, achieved strides in this field. Today, His Highness the Emir opened up the Shura Council with women in the Shura Council. We have women that are ministers. We have women in higher uh, ranks in the government. But there is not one single woman on a listed company board in Qatar. That is something that is astronomical. Studies show that the more the participation and diverse the board is, the better the uh, income or the uh, financial generation of a company is. All uh, uh, international companies now have it as a, uh, a requirement to have women in, on the C-suite to make sure that they have a good pipeline that can advance them into the board level. You have best, better decision making because there are better policies and procedures that cater for both genders. Creativity and innovation sparks up when there are two genders in the room. And 
as well, you have a, uh, an access to a larger pool of talent. Why just you know, stop your pool of talent as men? So we're actually now working with the Qatari Stock Exchange to see if it's possible, and it will be possible, once we, the no, no's, no's, no's happen, there will be a yes eventually. To incorporate it as a law, we have to have women on, listed mark, on the listed companies of, uh, uh, of Qatar. One of the things that I've read as well is that a McKenzie study shows that if we can use uh, the best empowerment of women in the workplace, we will be adding $12 billion into the overall, uh, tri sorry, 12 trillion, so it's a billion billion dollars onto the global GDP economy. If we can realize the full potential of women, we can add $28 trillion to the GDP. That means you eradicate poverty, you eradicate any kind of illiteracy, you have no problems in life. Yet, we still wonder women's participation, women don't participate, we're still speaking about it. So what have I learned? The final thing. Never underestimate yourself. You can and you will if you give it your 100%. And the, the thing I put here is give it 100%. You have to. As a mother, give it your 100%. As an entrepreneur, employee, as anyone, give it your 100%. As an advocate for change, an advocate for a better future for the next generation, give it your 100%. Because the universe is there and it is waiting for a dent. Again, I started my presentation with a question. I'm not going to use the E word. I want to use the empower, the power word. Each one of you has enormous powers in, in themselves. What I'm asking you today is to unleash these powers. You have so much to do and so much to give. Our generation really worked hard and we left Qatar a better place than the place that we came into. It's a question today of what are you going to do and how will you leave Qatar for the next generations? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sheikh Anadi. Um, we have some time for questions, and uh, we'll be taking questions from members of, of our community or our guests. Uh, if you can, when you ask your question, please introduce yourself. Uh, we will not be taking questions from the media today, and any members of the media who are present may direct inquiries directly to her office. There are some microphones around, and I think we're ready for the first question. Thank you. Yes, first of all, thank you so much. It's really refreshing uh, to hear you, your story, and what you are doing in this space. My name is Dr. Luana Ozemela. I am a professor at HBKU in the master's program in women's society and development. And my field is public policy and gender. Um, my question is about the, the, um, the portfolio of uh, invested companies under the funds that are managed by AMWAL. Um, I know I heard the initiative on 30% uh, uh, having more women in boards of listed companies. Uh, what is your view with respect to the invested companies and how maybe AMWAL is working uh, in, our, in that space of increasing also the diversity of the companies that are invested? Thank you. Thank you. Very important question. Just a disclaimer. I actually sold the asset management arm of Amwal uh, last year uh, to UBS, so uh, I'm not involved in that anymore. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, what we've noticed, even within in our international uh, uh, investments, that companies that have uh, uh, corporate governance, governances that open up more for uh, gender diversity, for uh, that have a pipeline uh, of women within the C-suite, 
usually perform better. And it's not only that what we've seen from companies that are uh, in the region as well as in, uh, in Europe or any places. Even uh, there is a very, very important study on the SMP that shows that financially they perform better in the long run. So um, I wasn't able actually to do that. I wasn't able to have a gender bias towards women in my investments, but I wish I did. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Sheikha. It was really a pleasure to hear from you and your uh, road to your practical life. Um, all I want to say is you being an inspiration to us women. Um, I'm Saima and I'm working. Uh, we moved to Qatar on a special project with Qatar Armed Forces with my husband three years ago. And since then, I've been working as a freelancer and few companies over here after the blockade. And uh, I found that uh, the way Qatar is progressing and the way women are uh, keeping their um, upfront level in this is really commendable. And you being today a really inspiration in uh, brushing up all our enthusiasm and hope. And uh, I just wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Girls, speak up. And I didn't have a chance to have any speakers when I was at university. I would have asked them a million questions. So really speak up. Uh, good afternoon. Sheikha, we're honored to have you today at university. My name is Zeldan and Smith. I'm a business administration sophomore. And my question to you is, what do you predict the future of the uh, female role in Qatar? Very, very promising. OK, I'll tell you a little antidote. Uh, and in Jazz Qatar, uh, we are actually, uh, we encourage the youth. Uh, um, we work on three different aspects, in, on financial literacy, in um, uh, entrepreneurship, promoting entrepreneurship, and success skills. And we do that through schools. And one of the things that we do is uh, we organize a competition where schools uh, create uh, a company and create a, a product or service and then compete with uh, each other. Uh, with each other. So for the last 15, 13 years, I've noticed that most of our uh, winners are girls. And most of our more enthusiastic students are girls. So uh, 10 years ago, I used to go to girls' schools, hope to empower them, hope to inspire them. I go to uh, Qatar University, the girls' section, you know, to empower, to uh, break uh, any kind of stereotypes. Uh, five, since five years ago, I stopped doing that. I only go to boys' school because I feel that us girls in Qatar are in a bigger advantage than men, unfortunately. And, you know, we came from an imbalance. We don't want to go to another imbalance. We are much more eager, much more equipped, although we're still, huh? we still didn't break uh, the, uh, uh, we're, there aren't a lot of numbers in the C-suite and the upper uh, management of the companies. But uh, if you ask any kind of employer, they would rather employ a Qatari girl than a Qatari boy. So I actually am encouraging Qatari men to say, Comp competition is fierce with your sisters. So compete, compete, and get ready. Hi, my name is Tatiana. I'm coming from Georgetown University. I actually wanted to ask a question about you serving on the board, because on the board there's male dominance, as I understood. And I'm just curious about dynamic there, because I'm coming from the West, and I know Whenever a man is speaking, there's more weight given to his word. So I'm just curious, when you're on the, on the board making decisions, how much weight is given to your words and what strategies and tools you are using so that your word is actually heard and taken action on? It has been um, a very uh, long uh, ride, actually. Uh, the first board I, I went into was in Qatar. And I remember sitting there and the rest of the board members looking down at their papers. They wouldn't even acknowledge that I was on the table. Um, fast forward, I think, um, it, it becomes a norm. 
you become a person, you don't become a gender. But you have to achieve, establish yourself. First of all, I'm completely against quotas because quotas mean that sometimes you have unqualified people in these seats and they backfire on you. As soon as you have qualified women on, on boards, and that means that you are arranging the pipeline, making sure you're giving them mentoring, they're, they're actually accelerating in their own careers to achieve that role, then you will have qualified women. And then gender doesn't matter. On boards, gender doesn't matter. And I can give you an antidote or, or two about me being in certain countries around the Gulf and wanting to go to the ladies' room, but there are no ladies' room on the board level. You have to go to the second, third level where, sec where the secretaries are because no one ha uses a woman's uh, room in the, on that level, on the executive level. But things are changing now. And I think it's, it, you know, we cannot put it as a fault of men. I actually think it's three quarters women's confidence that needs to be built, that they need to be heard, that they need to have a very good career path that can get them to that position. And then when they get there, it's gender, there is no gender bias. You're sitting there for the benefit of the company, for the benefit of being there. You're bringing your expertise and having a black Sheila or a Ghitla doesn't matter. Hello there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for a brilliant presentation. Very inspirational. It was a privilege, privilege to, to listen in. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm representing the Future Talent Council, and we invest in the Qatari job market and make it uh, keep having it a global hub for world-class talent. Um, it's so interesting because you've obviously seen the brilliant uh, educational system here in Qatar and the high level of quality, and you've also seen the job market from the side of the employer. Um, so from, from those two perspectives, what can we all do for Qatar to uh, remain a hub for world-class talent, uh, attract even more world-class talent, and retain the high-class talent that's already been developed here in this great nation? Thank you so much. A very good question. Um, I'm actually on the other side of uh, the coin. I'm actually working to have Qataris become world class talent. I want every Qatari youth to be competitive worldwide. We don't want to create students that can only compete on our local market. I want to see uh, the, uh, uh, the CEO of Deutsche Bank being a Qatari. I want to see uh, the president of the World Bank being a Qatari. So I work at it from the other side of uh, the point. But coming back to your question, we have a problem with our labor uh, market, with the pricing of the individual on our labor market. So the Qatari is priced in a different way that, than any uh, foreigner or outside, uh, uh, you know, talent is priced. And this sometimes skews the decision making. So first, we have to fix that. We have to make sure that we have one labor market. All compete in the same level. And then we look at attracting talent, making sure it's a fair ground for competition for Qataris and non-Qataris. And then I think, if um, um, by retaining talent, you mean the opening up of the country or the opening up. There was a magnificent speech for His Highness today at the opening up of the Shura Council. He actually pinpointed the problematic aspects that we are still having. So he spoke about, um, of course, we have a complete different legal, uh, uh, le legal uh, uh, authority than uh, the, uh, the uh, administrative or uh, the legislative uh, authorities. But he spoke about the delays in that. He spoke about ease of doing business, making sure that Qatar is for everyone. Everyone can come in home uh, and live in Qatar, but as well, it is my prerogative that for Qataris to be able to compete with world-class talent. We have world-class universities. We're sitting here at a university that matches if, you know, the one in the U.S. and bet is better than any kind of university around the world. So we should be able to produce world-class talent that can compete with any talent coming from abroad.
So uh, thank you, Sheikh Hanadi, for, for those wonderful insights. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, everybody to, who has attended the talk to uh, join us for a light lunch. Uh, we'll be doing some photographing up here. Thank you all for coming. There's another talk or two this uh, term, and I hope to see you all again. Thank you.